Time have arrived for Monday, October 20th, 2014, 7 o'clock. Finance Committee, I hereby call the, uh, the Finance Committee to order. Councilors, before we uh, get into the agenda, we have a few uh, pieces of information. Um, number one, Interim Chief uh, Hayden will not be able, to, Police Chief Hayden will not be able to join us uh, this evening. Um, uh, Board of Health Director Luke Tataglia also will not be able to join us this evening as well. And Councilors, when we get to agenda item number 14, which is my Resolve Aquaria, I'm going to ask Councilor Yanari, we're going to make a motion to continue that, Councilor, sure. to the second FinCom in November. Okay. The gentleman uh, is actually out of the country again uh, tonight. Uh, Councilors, before we get into the agenda item, I want to read a, an official citation uh, that's been prepared. And this gentleman served the city for over 36 years as a volunteer parks commissioner. And unfortunately, he cannot join us tonight, but we all know Tom Frizzell. And I spoke to him tonight, and uh, he wanted to be here, but unfortunately, he couldn't be here. Uh, you know, he's a great baseball coach of a master, so very successful. But this is a citation, official citation, City of Brockton. Be it known that the Brockton City Council hereby extends its congratulations to Mr. Tom Thomas Frizzell Sr. in recognition of his many years of dedicated public service to the City of Brockton as a member and former chairman of the Brockton Parks Commission. And be it further known that the City Council extends best wishes for continued success, that this citation be duly signed by the President, myself, of the City Council, and attested to in a copy, therefore, transmitted by the Clerk of the Council. And it is signed by Mr. Zioli, our Clerk. It's dated today, October 20th. It's offered by the Council collectively. And uh, myself, Robert Sullivan, as City Council President. And Mr. Frizzell uh, is very, very uh, touched uh, and pleased that the City Council, the legislative body, uh, has provided him this citation. It will be delivered to his house on the west side tomorrow. So I think we owe Mr. Frizzell for his dedication. <laughs> Madam Clerk, if we could go on to agenda item number one, please. Appointment, Jane Moynihan as a member of the Council on Aging Board for a three-year term ending in October 2017, invited Jane Moynihan. Good evening, Ms. Moynihan, how are you? I'm well, how are you? Good, do you have a statement for the Council? No, just think, I'd like to um, thank the Mayor, um, the Honorable Mayor Bill Car Carpenter for this wonderful appointment. It's a fabulous board to be on. Very, very busy board. We do Great. a lot. Well, we appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Move to approve. Second. Second. Not some money. Do you have something on the motion? Well, before I just was wondering, I think there's a typographical error here. She spells Monahan, M O Y N I H A. That's something wrong with that? You do it wrong. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Uh, motion made properly. Second. A favorable recommendation. Back to the full city council. All in favor, raise your hand. All opposed. Our motion carries. Thank you very much. Number two, please. Appointment, Chris Connolly, as a member of the Board of Park Commissioners for a five-year term ending March 2019, invited Chris Connolly. Mr. Connolly, good evening. Good evening. How are you, sir? Good, how are you? Good. Do you have a statement for the uh, committee? Uh, no, I do not. Okay. Move to approve. Second. Second. Motion made, properly seconded. Favorable recommendation back to full council. All in favor, raise your hands, please. All opposed, motion carries. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a good evening. Madam Clerk, three, please. Appointment, John Kenny, as a member of the Council on Aging Board for a three-year term ending in October 2017, invited John Kenny. Mr. Kenny, good evening. Good evening. How are you, sir? I'm doing fine, thank you. Do you have a statement for the committee? No, I think everyone knows me already. Motion to recommend favor. Second. Second. Motion made properly second. A favorable <laughs> recommendation back to the full council. All in favor, raise your hands, please. All opposed, motion <clears throat> carries. Thank you, Mr. Kenny. Uh, thank you very much. Councilor Stadensky, number 12, please. Thank you very much. I'd like to make a motion we take out of order. As soon as I find it, I'll get it for you. The, uh... Agenda item number 12. I'm sorry? Agenda item number 12 out of order. Thank you very much. Yes, that's correct. <laughs> Second. All in favor of taking agenda item out of, uh, number 12 out of order, please raise your hand. All opposed? Motion carries. Uh, Mr. Ianeri, if you could sit for me. Madam Clerk, number 12, please. Resolved that the City Solicitor, Interim Police Chief, Acting DPW Commissioner, and the Traffic Commissioner come before the Finance Committee to discuss lowering the driving speed limit on certain areas within the City, excluding streets, highways, roads, under the State's authority as part of an effort to reduce pedestrian injuries and or deaths. Invited Larry Rowley, Acting DPW Commissioner, Philip Nesvella, City Solicitor, Robert Hayden, Interim Police Chief, Robert DeBarry, Traffic Commissioner. Those guests that are uh, present here, if you just want to come up front and then I'm going to... Defer to uh, 
Councilor Sullivan first. Uh, oops. Mr. Chair, thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, members of the committee, I filed this resolve uh, in light of the fact that the city of Brockton has uh, some, uh, some pedestrian deaths and some serious injuries. Uh, but the precedent is uh, that the city of New York, and I'm not comparing Brockton to New York, but the city council in the city of New York recently just drafted this legislation uh, to decrease uh, miles per hour speed limit uh, within the jurisdiction roads that are not highway roads or uh, state roads. And uh, in my prior uh, employment where I was town attorney over in the neighboring community of Randolph, we did that as well. We lowered the speed limit in certain areas, but we worked in conjunction with the traffic commission which is what my hope would be uh, if this is favorable from a council to work with the traffic commission, the dedicated traffic commissioners and the law enforcement personnel. Uh, but I, I, I think this was uh, important and I know the, the mayor would concur with that. I think it was important to talk about this issue and it was just uh, ironic that, uh, that the New York Post and New York Times just ran a story about this and unfortunately we lost uh, two lives here. Um, and again, uh, some people will say uh, jaywalking uh, is, is a problem, uh, but nonetheless, speed needs to be looked at because without the speed, you wouldn't have the injuries and, and ultimately the deaths. With that being said, Mr. Chair, I'm gonna open it up to the invited guests. Thank you, uh, Councilor. So, Mayor. Mr. Chair, if I could just lay the groundwork for a moment and then I'll turn it over to uh, Traffic Commissioner DeBarry, Captain DeBarry. Uh, I agree with everything Councilor Sullivan said in his opening remarks. I think we're all extremely concerned about pedestrian safety. I thought uh, I would just give you a quick update as to where we're at on this so that you can see where um, uh, consideration of this may fit in. Uh, we have already, uh, I personally reached out to the uh, then supervisor, now interim secretary of transportation, a few weeks ago, we met on a couple of occasions, Mr. DiPaolo, Secretary DiPaolo. He's pledged uh, quite a bit of help from the state level to the city of Brockton in terms of uh, trying to help us improve pedestrian safety. Uh, we are at an alarming rate of pedestrian accidents this year, no doubt. Uh, as a result of that, last week, uh, Chief Hayden, Captain DeBarry, myself, Lieutenant Crowley, met with members of the Massachusetts State Police and also the Massachusetts De Department of Transportation. And a number of initiatives were agreed upon uh, that have already begun to be worked on, including <clears throat> my request for a road safety audit of the stretch of Belmont Street from the entrance to the high school up to the intersection of Torrey Street, which has been a particularly troublesome stretch of Belmont Street. And they've agreed to do that, and that study has already begun. In a road safety audit, they will look at, um, from an engineering standpoint, what improvements may be able to be made to increase safety, such as flashing lights, additional signage, adding a crosswalk, sidewalks, et cetera. And I'm sure, Council, that speed limit would be something that they would look at also. And that's a state road right there, I understand. Uh, at the same time, you know, we've had a, a far wide-ranging discussion, and essentially our initiatives in this area are going to come in around three areas, uh, and it's, it's the three E's, and it's engineering, education, and enforcement. So we discussed initiatives with the state police and the state DOT in all of those areas, uh, and those are all underway. Captain DeBarry will tell you in a moment that he provided at that meeting all of the crash data for Brockton, uh, including all of the pedestrian accidents. And so that data has been turned over to the state and they're analyzing it right now as part of their review to see what recommendations they may bring forward. We've also made a joint commitment with state DOT, the city and the schools to provide a very aggressive, multicultural, um, campaign of information and education around uh, both pedestrian and bicycle safety. It's interesting that the, um, the crash expert that was there from the state police said that in analyzing the seven pedestrian accidents that have been fatalities this year, they've concluded their, their investigations in six out of the seven, and in all six they found it to be pedestrian fault, not driver fault. So this is a lot more complicated than just one single traffic issue. Uh, you know, we have to address things like being a distracted pedestrian also, 
wearing earbuds, headphones that causes a pedestrian to not be as aware of their surroundings as they should be. Um, and the basic rules of, you know, crossing, crossing across walks and uh, taking care. So it, it's really complex, but I think in looking at engineering, uh, education, and enforcement, all three, uh, we can make the city safer. We have to make the city safer for pedestrian and bicycle traffic. <clears throat> um, Captain DeBarry and the traffic unit, they've already assigned additional patrols to that Belmont Street area. And uh, during the meeting with Major Thomas of the state police, he pledged us additional state police traffic enforcement patrols for Brockton. And uh, he didn't have an exact date, but he said the, uh, he is already sending some, but he's gonna make a larger commitment to Brockton sometime during the month of November. Probably three cruisers daily assigned to Brockton for traffic enforcement. So I think, um, Council, that's another way to get the cars to slow down a little bit is with uh, more visible, more proactive enforcement. Um, and we believe traffic enforcement makes the city safer for a lot of reasons. Um, so I, I think that we have a number of issue, initiatives moving. On November 6th, we are scheduled to meet with the state police and state DOT again. That's when they'll be giving us some feedback from the crash data that's been provided. Uh, and we'll also be formalizing plans for the uh, public awareness campaign that uh, will include the state making a media buy um, and underwriting the cost of it. And we've also had a great dialogue with Superintendent of Smith, uh, Superintendent of Schools, Kathleen Smith. And as a result of that, uh, she has all of the Brockton elementary and middle schools enlisting in the Safe Routes to School program, which is sponsored by DOT. Now, six of our schools were already participating, but she now has all of the other schools applying to participate. That brings uh, an age-appropriate educational course into the schools, a curriculum that the DOT provides. Uh, so also with the state police and DOT, they have some plans for the spring with the high school to bring a crash simulator in and do some interesting things like that to hopefully uh, be able to do some good education with young people who are just getting their driver's licenses or will be getting their driver's licenses in the near future. So I talked a lot more than I, ex I uh, expected to, but we have a number of initiatives going on. And um, I guess I would ask, or I will have Captain Barry speak on part of the Traffic Commission, but I think we're gonna be interested to see what some of the recommendations are from the state based upon uh, the crash data that Brockton has provided. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Thank Mayor. You. Thank you, Mayor. Captain uh, DeBerry, if you can just... Uh, yeah, just answer any questions if you have any. Uh, we, we, uh, we were gonna hope to get some answers from the uh, state police, the audit, and then uh, move on from there. Okay, does anyone have any, Councilor Sullivan? I do, I just have one question. Captain, in regards to uh, roads that are within the auspices of the confines of the city, under the city limits, not the state, uh, like I said in Randolph, we lowered them over there um, through the legislative body. Um, do, you, do you have any opinion? Can you opine one way or the other relative to if you think uh, that that would work here? I mean, the city of Brockton is much larger and we have many more roads, but um, when you look at what New York did, bringing it down to 25 miles an hour in certain areas, do you think that there's any validity or uh, something we should follow up on that? Sure. I, I mean, 30 miles an hour down to 25, it's not a lot, but, uh, you know, Hopefully it'll give you a little more stop time. Um, it's definitely something we can look at in combination with a bunch of other things. Perfect. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Chair. Councilor Stewart. Great, thank you. Um, Captain, right? Yes. Excellent. I, uh, several questions. One, so the, the, the standard city speed limit at the moment is 30, you mentioned, right? Correct. And then what would be the cost of, so streets that are sort of standard 30, there are no speed limit signs, right? Because the understanding is that if it's not posted, it's 30. Is that That's right. understanding? That's right. So there are no costs associated with, I guess there would have to be a cost associated with dropping the speed limit because folks would have to be aware that it's 25 and not 30. Is that correct? Yes, it would probably be an education thing more than putting up a thousand 25 mile an hour speed zone. And legally that would, that would be that would protect the city, meaning so it, I, I just remember that in the Commonwealth, if it's not posted, you should know that it's 30. And if there are streets that are different than 30, there are always signs posted. So if there's just an education campaign and no posting, who becomes liable? How do you cite someone for speeding? 
I would, uh, I would refer that to the law department. Maybe I can ask the city solicitor since he's here that question. Because I'm, I'm interested in the cost of implementing a speed limit change if we have to then post signs on all these streets where the changes are made. I'm sorry, Council, I didn't hear the question. I was right, so my understanding in Massachusetts, if there's no speed limit sign posted, uh, as part of your driver's education, you, you understand at that point that the limit is 30. 30 miles, correct. So if we change the, the limit to 25 without posting new signs, how do we then cite someone for speeding if there's no sign there? I think you say, have to post the signs. So you would have to post yes. the signs. So then my question is, what would the cost be for posting all new signs throughout the city for 25, whatever it may be? Would have to, that would have to be part of the program, figuring out how much signage we need, and, and uh, I wouldn't be able to answer that right now. Okay, great. Uh, and I'm, concerning the data, thank you, Mrs. Mrs. Solicitor. Um, so concerning the, the crash data, um, particularly, I guess I'm interested of the recent accidents, the, the seven or so, but just in general, are we, in those accidents, were, was the driver speeding? I know the mayor mentioned that the pedestrian was at fault, but with that being the case, what were the speeds of the drivers in those incidents? I, I wouldn't have that information. If they weren't at fault, they wouldn't have been cited, therefore we wouldn't, I wouldn't know what, so they, how fast they were going. And so is there, so would that be, so that wouldn't be in the information no, at all? Not. No, no. And is there a situation where they could have been speeding but not cited because the pedestrian was also at fault? If they were speeding, would they automatically be at fault or no? It's usually they would be, they would have been cited. If they were, if they were speeding, it would have been a fault thing. So they would have been, I see. they would have been cited for that. Right. So at least what, at least of the six of the seven incidents, then the speeding wasn't, it wasn't an issue. Correct. We can, we can have that summation there. Okay. Um, And then the, I'm assuming then the state would, as part of the recommendations, the one thing that I had asked in previous years for the city to consider were, were two sort of safety initiatives for the roads. One was the mobile speed limit signs, and I don't know how effective they are. However, I know that when I run into one myself, I tend to slow down. Um, and then secondly, I'm not certain what they're called, but the the rumbles in the road. So when you're driving on the freeway and you sort of move over to the, the shoulder and you run across that perforated, whatever, the strip. Yep. Um, I've also seen that placed in some cities where speeding is an issue or where safety is a, a central concern to have it placed in, not on the freeway, but sort of in the middle of the street. So when you run across it, you know to slow down. Um, will the state be offering those kinds of rec recommendations? Do you think, do you know? I, I don't know if they will. I've never seen them on the city streets. Um, but the moving signs, we do have one of those. I saw one. And, you know, as I get complaints of speed as we move it around, as Councillor Rodriguez could tell you. Because <clears throat> um, I would like to, I'm hoping that as part of what they will recommend, because I've seen that used effectively in Massachusetts on my way to, um, See what they recommend. Like going to Mattapan. Um, I can't remember what road it is. I can find out what road it is, but it is used on a. Okay. And then lastly, I'm assuming then also, one of my concerns have always been, or has always been, the lack of sidewalks, uh, particularly which, when, it, when there's <coughs> inclement weather and students are traveling to school or walking to school and they're forced to walk in the middle of the road, which I think is, has always been a hazardous issue. Um, I'm hoping that the recommendation um, would also include the need for additional sidewalks. And then does, do these recommendations come with funding, I guess is my, my last question. <laughs> We're hoping so. Uh, I know there is a Southwest Corridor study going on right now, with including with um, uh, roads and sidewalks and and all that. I know that's an ongoing. Um, who's going to pick up the cost? I don't know. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Council. Council of Bonds. Uh, yes. Thank you, um, Chairman. I just, I guess I just want to say, it's not really a question, if, if you give me just a little bit of time uh, leeway on this, um, I'll address it to you, uh, Captain DeBerry, but if the mayor can also, um, you know, be aware. Um, one of the more recent fatalities, uh, Carla Evan Yancey, tragedy all around. And in, uh, after the funeral, actually, I was speaking with a sister who's a really good friend of mine, and she was just mentioning to me that earlier that evening, that Sunday evening, she'd been coming from somewhere, I don't know where she was coming from, coming down Belmont Street, and she said that she remembered thinking quickly that from the VA to virtually around Belmont Street or the crash site, if you catch that first light at the VA at the right time, 
the entire Belmont Street, they're all green lights, they're all synchronized. And if that were to happen on a street like Belmont Street and you know, somebody gets distracted or they just kind of get drive blindness and, and kind of keep going, it's dark in some areas, um, it really could be a problem. And I just wanted to, to suggest that in that study that they do in that area that they might also think about um, staggering those lights um, at all times and, and traffic that comes into those streets. I know that, um, is, is it Linwood or Longwood um, Street right there Linwood. by McMenemies? Linwood Street. That's another place, a, a really a high crash um, site as well. So I just want to make sure that her particular concern um, is, is addressed on that. Yeah, I'll pass that along, Council, but so that you know, in that section of Belmont Street where they've already begun the road safety audit, mm -hmm. that actually includes five intersections, and they're studying all five intersections as part of that road safety audit of that stretch of uh, Belmont Street, so I'm sure they are okay. looking at signaling as one of the many engineering issues to take a look at. Okay, excellent. And um, with regard to uh, the seven deaths and six found pedestrian fault, um, where, where, does that, where does that kind of leave the city with liability? I don't know if that's a, a, a legal <coughs> question, and I've just never really heard of of, of all the cases that, that have kind of come up that we hear about in, uh, you know, on TV and on the news and everything, um, how is it pedestrian fault when they're children? Unless those aren't the ones that were... I'm only relating what the, uh, the state trooper who does the crash uh, reconstruction relayed, but I think that regardless of ages and circumstances, they still come to a conclusion as to what contributed to the accident from which party. So I think that um, in the one that you referenced, I believe, is the one that's still under investigation. But okay. uh, you're right, a couple of the others do involve children, but I guess what they're basically saying is that the driver wasn't doing anything wrong. The driver was within the mock lane driving. The speed limit was not doing anything that contributed, it, and the, the child ended up in front of the car with the driver not having the ability to stop. Okay. But I think basically that the driver, there was no mistakes on the part of the driver, and in each instance, the, you know, the child came out unexpectedly uh, where the driver couldn't do anything about it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor. Councilor Sullivan. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm going to make a motion, but through you to my colleague, Councilor at Large uh, Stewart, um, the, in terms of the, the signage question, the standard in Massachusetts uh, legally is whatever the fundamental speed limit is, that's the standard fundamental, which is adopted as 30 miles in, per hour. If the city of Brockton decided, like the city of New York, to go down to 25 miles an hour, you would post it as such, but that would be the new fundamental speed limit. So you'd post it to major entrances, the major roads that are within the city of Brockton entrances, so the cost would be nominal. Mr. Chair, with that, I want to make a favorable recommendation back to the council. Second. Motion for made and seconded. Return back to the full city council with favorable recommendation. All in favor. Opposed goes back to the full uh, city council. <coughs> Madam Clerk, we return back to the okay. item number four. Shirley. Council Azak, please. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to motion to take number 11 out of order. Second. Do a second on that? Second, yes. Motion made properly seconded to take agenda item number 11 out of order. All in favor, please raise your hand. All opposed, motion carries. Madam Clerk, number 11, please. Resolved that Patricia Kelleher, President and CEO of Family and Community Resources, Incorporated, Laverne O'Leverne Gordon, President of Love Life New Foundation, Incorporated, and Aaron Bomagardel, Director of Violence Intervention and Prevention of Health Imperatives, be invited before a committee of this council to discuss domestic violence awareness and its resources. Invited Patricia Kelleher, President and CEO of Family and Community Resources, Laverne Gordon, President of Love Life New Foundation Incorporated, and Aaron Bomagardel, Director of Violence Intervention and Prevention of Health Imperatives. Council Isaac. Mm -hmm. I'd like to invite the um, ladies up to the podium. Good evening, ladies. Good evening, ladies. I know. Um, Pat, you have some stuff to give out to the councilors, I, I believe. Do. Thank you. We all do. Oh, great. Thank you. Okay. I'll do it. Give me a second. Hi, how are you? Thank you. Yeah, I can get up. I'm younger than you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. 
much. Merci beaucoup, mon <laughs> kitty. Thanks for coming in today. <laughs> Thank you. It's a type of freaking place that goes more hard at home. Thank you. It's real time. So members of the committee, this is, um, I filed this resolve because October is uh, Domestic Violence Awareness Month. And we have a, a few agencies in the city and I just want to bring awareness to our constituents, uh, see what we can do on our part. It's a big problem, not often talked about and sometimes people don't know where to go to. So um, that's why we, we invited these wonderful ladies and thank you for being here this evening with us. I know it's, um, you've had a long day, but I appreciate you being here. So thank you. So if you'd like to tell us a little bit about your agencies, if you want to start with um, Pat, thanks. Probably because I'm the oldest. <laughs> um, thank you all for inviting us here tonight and for City Councilor Azak for taking the time to sit as a new councilor and find out sort of what is going on in the city of Brockton as it relates to domestic violence. In the month of September, Family and Community Resources, which provides a continuum of free confidential services to adult, child, adolescent, and adult victims of domestic violence, saw 146 adult victims from the city of Brockton and provided services. This police department, it's one of the highest numbers of, the highest number of responses they make is to homes and domestic violence, oftentimes the most serious and the most dangerous for police officers. They had over 146 calls just in the city of Brockton. Out of those 146 calls, we provided services to 48 children under the age of 17 who had witnessed violence in their home. We've worked with, more recently working with Chief Hayden, with Lieutenant Crowley, with Captain Hallisey, and with the new community police officer, Alyssa Fonts, who is working with our Cape Verdean domestic violence advocate to reach out to all of the victims who the City of Brockton Police Department responds to. Since 2006, we've had a continuing uh, grant with, through the Violence Against Women Office, the Office of Justice in Washington, and have a civilian police advocate who's signed directly to the City of Brockton to provide services, to provide so support services, to do anything that needs to be done for victims. Um, in your packet, you'll find um, two specific um, sort of stapled together literature, and it's the new laws. It's a, a summary of all of the new laws that were passed this year in, in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts that relate to victims of domestic violence and sexual assault. There's a second packet that you should pay attention to because it relates to any company with 50 or more employees and the new law that specifically states um, all the parameters of that law. Um, I was happy to see Mr. Cooney here tonight from the Chamber of Commerce because Family and Community Resources is working with the Chamber to bring that information to all the local businesses um, so that they'll know exactly what it is that they're responsible for in order to help victims of domestic violence and their children. The, other piece of the work that Family and Community Resources does, we have nine groups for men who, have, who are adjudicated through the court as offenders of domestic violence. Those services are provided in um, four, five different languages. Um, the services are on a sliding fee scale. We have sort of a captive audience. Most of them are on probation and they'll get violated if they don't attend. But it's also an attempt to change their behavior, to make them better citizens, and as most of them have children, to teach them to be more responsible, nurturing fathers. And by changing their behavior, we can cut down in the city of Brockton the number of our residents, whether they're in our schools, we work with the chief of police at Massasoit, whether they're in our elementary schools, our junior high schools, or the high school. We need to do something in the city, and I thank all of you for all of your efforts, and especially to Councillor Azak for having us here this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Keller. Hi, I'm Julia Keogh. I'm the president and CEO of Health Imperatives. Thank you all so much for having me tonight and for all you do 
to keep the residents of Brockton safe. Um, we've handed out two different um, pieces of information. The first is what is Health Imperatives? We're a large nonprofit based in Brockton that we run a number of different programs that may have program recognition but not name recognition. So part of what we're trying to do is to let people know everything we do, where we are, and how to reach us. Um, and we work very closely with Pat's group and other organizations locally so that we can take some of the guesswork out of where people get services. The second um, brochure is called our Violence Intervention and Prevention Services, and that's what's um, most important here tonight. Um, in addition to uh, running an emergency shelter for victims of domestic violence here in Brockton, we also have a 24-hour hotline um, for anyone who has any assistance with sexual assault or domestic violence. Uh, last year, we served 2,200 people in um, Plymouth County for sexual assault counseling and domestic violence services for people who are 25 and under, sexual assault for all adults and all children. Um, we also operate the Safe Plan program in the Brockton District Court, where last year we helped over 554 individuals receive um, restraining orders. We're trying to work more closely with local organizations, schools, and start doing prevention earlier on. Um, as you know, there's been a lot of press lately in the colleges about dating violence and sexual assault. We've done a lot to work with those colleges, but realize that we need to start much, much younger. Um, similarly, we're looking at all of the other factors that go into violence and sexual assault, um, and that includes substance abuse. So we're trying to look at things much more holistically so that we can um, not only serve people who are victims or survivors, but help prevent it in the first place. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hello everyone, my name is Laverne Gordon and I'm the president of Love Life Now Foundation. So we're rooted out of Brockton and we come from a different, uh, a bit of a different standpoint as opposed to FCR, Family and Community Resources and Health Imperatives. What we do is put on community events throughout the year that get people out and about talking about the issue of domestic violence. Too often you hear about a shelter uh, like FCR or Health Imperatives when you get to a police station or a hospital. And we want to bridge the gap between shelters and the communities that they serve. So we've worked over the years with uh, Pat and uh, Julia um, to put on events that, again, get people out. Three of the events that we do, um, one is the bedding drive, which just currently ended this past Saturday. We asked folks to donate a new pillow or a sheet. Uh, what happens is that the residents and the you know, children, they end up transitioning to another shelter or somewhere on their own and they take the sheets and the pillows with them. We try to help replenish those basic supplies um, for the shelters. The other event that we do is the last Friday in February, which is called the White Ribbon Night Gala. And that promotes more male awareness against domestic violence and engages men in the whole idea of standing up uh, against violence against women and children. And then we also have a walk that we usually uh, promote uh, during the month of June that asks men and or, <laughs> actually women and or men to walk in heels. Um, so these, these all heighten awareness throughout the year um, to get people involved on the issue. I myself am a child witness and a survivor um, of domestic violence from 99 to 2001, and I grew up seeing my mother brutally beaten by my father. So it's a very, it's a cause that's near and dear to my heart. But again, we want to we want to charge you, City Council, with you know being more being present more at these types of events so that we can put a face to the people that help on behind the scenes as well as uh, the people that do the frontline work like FCR and uh, family and community, res I'm sorry, health imperatives. So that's who we are and uh, we thank you for putting a light on, on, on such a taboo subject. Thank you very much. Thank you. Laverne, thank you. Um, I just have one question and that could be for either one of you ladies. If um, we have constituent out there or people that are watching and they they're either a victim or they know somebody that's a victim of domestic violence. What is the easiest way, if you can give either a number or a website or anything, just the quickest way that somebody can contact you? Sure, for um, Family and Community Resources, they can call 508-583-6498 um, or they can go online to www.fcr-ma.org and there's a link there where you can change it to any language that you would like 
and you can um, hit a send and it'll send an anonymous email or they can, and they can ask for help or they can leave a name, phone number and someone will get right back to them. The, all the agencies have 24 um, hour hotlines that are manned by staff, so they can call also. And is it anonymous? I know a lot of people sometimes are concerned about anonymity. I mean, they don't want like Absolutely, they're yes. something. Yes, and family members also call, friends and family members who don't know what to do. Um, and so they can call and, you know, and that's the question that they ask, what can I do? Sometimes it's just leaving a brochure where somebody can see it and they can pick it up. And sometimes it takes people four or five or six times calling before they actually decide to make that move, which also is the most dangerous time when they do decide to leave. Thank you. So I'll share the national hotline, which is 1-800-799-SAFE. Again, 1-800-799-SAFE. And again, as Pat mentioned, you can call anonymously. The idea of this whole uh, epidemic is that people are not speaking up, and that's the worst thing that you can do on your own behalf is not speak up. Call, and you can call anonymously to, to seek help. I know there are a lot of numbers here. Um, I think that any one of us, if we get a call, will refer people to the right place. But for any um, emergency shelter for domestic violence or sexual assault, the toll-free number of ours is 888-293-7273. And again, it's all over the website, et cetera, but you can't go wrong by calling any one of us. Thank you, and thank, thank you for the information you shared with us. Is cost of stable recommendation? Y Mr. Yes, President, on the motion? On the motion. Uh, just so I can uh, mention, I, uh, I'm excited you guys are here and had the pleasure of attending um, <clears throat> a lot of the functions held by the New Love Foundation, uh, both the walk and the gala. And uh, it's just, it's always a great experience and I appreciate what you do and it's always <coughs> fantastic meeting new people who um, are concerned about the issue but also folks who are uncertain but want to learn more and, and open to that. You may have to come up to the. Yeah. Uh, well, the idea is that what I was mentioning, as, as Jess mentioned, is getting people in the same space, not necessarily singled out as a, a victim, a survivor, but being a, aware and connecting, you know, agencies like FCR and Health Imperatives and putting a face to um, uh, what these people do. They're on the front line every day dealing with uh, victims and survivors, but we want folks to understand that there's help even before that. Um, reaching out, if you're a friend, if you're a family member, if you're an, understanding what an advocate does, and you do learn that at these events, and I do appreciate Jace always being at uh, our events and, and, and making and putting a face to the government part of it, um, because you guys do help. Uh, uh, it starts somewhere, and we really appreciate everything that you do. Thank and, you. and then lastly, with health imperatives, recently I had someone who found me so incredibly adorable that the person would leave me alone. And um, <laughs> I, had to, I had to get some, uh, some support on that issue, but, uh, and I wasn't aware that health uh, imperatives ran this particular program in the city. It was really just a fantastic operation. Um, and um, so your presence in the city, uh, is, is, again, is very much appreciated. The work you guys do is just uh, phenomenal, so thank you. Yeah, and thanks to my colleague for uh, bringing this to our attention. It's great that residents can make connections to people who are doing the work in the city uh, in person, so to speak. So thank you. Council Zach made a motion for favorable recommendations. Is there a second? Second. second. Motion made properly second. Favorable recommendation back to the full city council. All in favor, please raise your hands. All opposed, motion carries. Favorable recommendation back to the full city council. Councilor Bonds. Chairman, uh, <laughs> Keep thank running. you. I'd like to um, have number uh, ten. number ten uh, read out of order, please. Second. And motion thank made you. properly. Second to take number ten. Agenda item number ten out of order. All in favor, raise your hand, please. All opposed. The motion carries. Number ten, Madam Clerk. Resolved that representatives of the Brockton area branch and AACP be invited to appear before a committee of this council to report on the efforts of the organization. Invited Stephen Bernard, president of the NAACP. Good evening, Mr. Bernard. Good evening. We are the NAACP, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. Our mailing address is uh, Box 1535, Brockton, Mass, 02303. We hold our uh, public meetings on the fourth Monday of each month at 80 Legion Parkway, that's the Messiah Baptist Church. All are welcome. Our new website is 
NAACP dash Brockton branch dot org. Repeating NAACP dash Brockton branch dot org. Our Facebook page is Brockton Area NAACP. On November 8th of this year, Saturday, November 8th at 7 o'clock at Lombardo's in Randolph, we will be celebrating our 60th anniversary as, the, as a chartered branch of the National Association for the Advancement of the Colored People, the Brockton Area Chapter. Yes, the Brockton Chapter has been in Brockton since 1954, 1954. The guest speaker for that evening will be Liz Walker, former anchor woman from Channel 4, WBZ. And our MC will be Mr. Byron Barnett, who is the host of Urban Update on Channel 7. There will be dinner, dancing, and a wonderful time to be had by all, and we invite you all to come. We are the NAACP, and our mission is to ensure political, educational, social, economic equality of rights to all persons and to eliminate racial hatred and discrimination. We, we meaning you, the elected officials, the leaders of Brockton, we meaning the community activists and volunteers, the citizens and residents, we are the spirit and the image of Brockton, Brockton, the city of champions, Brockton, a United States champion city, Brockton, a city of industrial firsts, Brockton, a city of civic and educational firsts. We, all of us, are the spirit and the image of Brockton. Therefore, it is our responsibility, our responsibility, together to ensure the political, educational, social, economic equality of rights of all persons and to eliminate racial hatred and <coughs> racial discrimination. It is often said we've come a long way, but we have still a long way to go. The NAACP has championed the efforts in the United States and abroad to reverse culture, the culture of racial superiority contrived and perpetuated to the detriment of humanity. The NAACP was established in 1909, and the first branch was chartered in Boston in 1910. The Brockton branch was chartered in 1954. Of the 60 people, or the 60 persons, who first met to establish the NAACP, only seven, only seven were African Americans that presided over the predominantly, they were, we were provided, presided predominantly uh, by, the, by Jewish leadership on our board of directors until the beginning of the civil rights era in the 1950s. We elected a president of the NAACP in 1966, a Boston businessman and philo philanthropist of Lithuanian and Jewish descent. He served uh, until 1975, and that was Mr. Kivi Kaplan. It was not until 1975 that the first African American presided, over, uh, presided as president of the National Board of the NAACP, and that was James Weldon Johnson. In 1954, when we were established here in Brockton, our first president was none other than attorney Bernard Cohen. He was elected our first president. As you well know, he later became Judge Cohen. The persecution and the animosity towards blacks and Jews had existed in these United States for too long. We had a long way to go. Uh, we had been a long way, but yet we have still so far to go. 60 years in Brockton. You know, in Brockton, there were 39 shoe manufacturers in 1919 that employed over 13,000 people. By 1964, there are only 10 shoe factories in Brockton, employing only 2,000 people. It was in 1963, under the, under the Kennedy administration, that the War on Poverty was, was established and formally implemented in, in, in 1965. Another first for Brockton. In Brockton, the percent of individuals with an income less than $2,500 annually accounted for 47% of our total population, 72,813 people. 
That was in 1959, according to the, uh, the then-released 1960 census. I'll repeat, 47% of all people who lived in Brockton in 1959 fell below the poverty line, only $2,500 annually. Brockton put into effect one of the first programs in the country under the Anti-Poverty Act with job opportunities for 500 youth. It was the Self-Help Incorporated. A community action program was, uh, was not only, which not only uh, was a community action program which was not only concerned with economic impoverishment, impoverishment but also with the poverties of education, culture, opportunity, and hope. So again, I say Brockton had another first. We were one of the first to establish a self-help program under the war in poverty. Brockton self-help then developed a subsidy, subsidy called Brockton Neighborhood Youth Corps, a living program uh, uh, of which Senator Edward Kennedy commended. commended. And uh, we also oper uh, established Operation Head Start. Among the founding officers of the self-help was none other than Vernon Sport, who in 1965 was elected the NAACP president. During our 60th anniversary celebration, we'll be recognizing five people. Among them will be Bernard Cohen, our first president, Vernon Sport, our uh, 1965 president, and a little bit more about Vernon Sport. Vernon Sport, before coming to Brockton and, and during his uh, military years, was a Tuskegee Airman. And after leaving Brockton, he moved to Conyers, uh, Conyers Georgia, where he continued his service to uh, justice and equality and was given a day named in his honor uh, in the city of Conyers, Georgia, and also celebrated by the United States Post Office for his valor in, in service in, as a Tuskegee Airman. During those tumultuous years of the war in poverty, Brockton also suffered and uh, demographic the demographics, the racial demographics, uh, suffered economically, and the de racial demographics of Brockton's rapid, rapidly changed uh, during those years. There were population changes, there were aging facilities, there were housing, real estate patterns of, of, of change, and also zoning laws uh, changed. Another person that will be recognized during our 60th anniversary for his service to Brockton was none other than Robert C. Jones. Robert Jones and his career as Brockton, uh, at the Brockton school system began in the 1960s, and he was a teacher at North Junior High School at that time. He, he later became, uh, later held several administrative positions, including uh, assistant principal at North Junior High School, coordinator of administrative services, administrative assistant for the entire system, and as superintendent of schools, put together a school improvement plan that uh, solved the segregation problems that had plagued of officials for, for decades. By locating new magnet schools in downtown area, he helped quali uh, qualify the city for state funds to build three new schools, the Arnone, the Pluff, and the Angelo. We're also very, very proud of our Brockton Public Library, and we'll be celebrating none other than Lucia Shannon, who's the head of adult services. When she first took note of the, li of the library collection, she observed that the industrialists of Brockton were honored, but information about artists, authors, and members of the various ethnic communities were not as well represented. Uh, so she began chronicling all the articles and, and, and events that were happening in the multicultural uh, uh, communities of Brockton. And she credits most of her years of service uh, to the city of Brockton to some noted people that you, whose names you will recognize, and they include Priscilla Pat Gomes, Willie Wilson, Mary Baker, Joan Madden, Dick Mapp, Hazel Johnson, Esther Crum, uh, Juliet and Greg Armstrong, Sylvia, uh, Sylvia Donaldson, Donna Cotterell, Francis and Louis Pina, Ozzy Jordan, Reverend Diane Johnson, on and on, and, and the list goes on and <laughs> goes on and on. So we'll be celebrating Lucy, Lucia Shannon for her wonderful work, work and contribution to the library and to the community. Adrian Niles, you've already, you've already uh, celebrated for his work uh, as a young man 
uh, who captured the gold medal award for the AXO program, AXO standing for Academic, Cultural, Technological, and Scientific Olympics, a program uh, held, <coughs> held by uh, NAACP branches for students of the, uh, it's the ninth grade to the 12th grade. And of course, Adrian attended uh, Southeastern Regional Technical School, but lives here in Brockton. Uh, he, he won the scientific award and was, uh, uh, was awarded uh, by the president for his achievement at, at the White House. He sets the standard for young people that the NAACP aspires for all children in Brockton and in the area to have the opportunity to excel. A fully operational Brockton branch or any branch that is fully operational in, in the uh, NAACP system would have committees that uh, are staffed with at least three people on each committee. And they are the communications, the community coordination, education, finance, freedom, health committee, legal redress, membership and life membership, political action, religious affairs, youth works, women in the nation, which stands, which whose acronym is WIN, armed service and, and veterans affairs, economic development, housing, labor and industry, prison branch, AXO, and, and youth adults, youth and adult branch. The Brockton branch needs your help to fill these committees. Naturally, most branches only have a dozen or so, or even a half dozen, de de depending upon uh, the size of the branch and the commitment of, the, of their members. In Brockton, our education, our, ed, our focus is on education. Closing the achievement glass, uh, closing the achievement gap, school discipline code, keeping kids in school and out of and out of the criminal justice system, establishing an adult advisory group whereby parents will have a better understanding of the school's rules and students' responsibilities and their and their role in 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 fostering an, uh, an educational appreciation in their own family and in their home. Uh, another area of concentration is legal redress. Even tonight, after leaving here, I'll be doing intake for, for a person uh, who feels as though their civil rights have been violated. We'll be doing intake, and then uh, we'll be referring, depending on the, the nature uh, of, of the intake, uh, to, to counsel and or to agencies such as MCAD, the Lawyers Committee Against Civil Rights, or for Civil Rights, uh, Attorney General's Office, and other legal service, legal service groups. In political action, <coughs> we are always uh, working very hard for voter registration and voter information, and we hold forums <coughs> on various political issues. And of course, we will be reestablishing in Brockton our own AXO program, which we had for so many years uh, working. And in fact, from Brockton, we've had several silver and bronze medal winners, but not until Adrian Niles had we a winner of the gold medal uh, for, for a student here in Brockton. But the AXO program will be reestablished here in Brockton this, year, this next year, and we're really looking forward to uh, developing winners and leaders among our youth. The Brockton chapter will only operate and be successful with your help. It is not the black organization, it's a civil rights organization, and all of us can be members. Its success depends upon believing that we are responsible for eliminating racial hatred and discrimination. Thank you very much for your time this evening, and I hope you'll all come out to the 60th anniversary on November 8th to celebrate 60 years in Brockton. Thank you, Mr. Bernard. Councilor. Um, actually, this was uh, Councilor Monaghan's uh, resolve. That was it. Resolve, I think, well, thank you for the update. Just what, um, <clears throat> what can we uh, see on your new website? Have you got, is it all revamped or what have you? What can people, can they become members by, on, the, uh, on the website? Is there where, somewhere they could sign up on the website for that or anything else, what your meetings are and what have you? All of the above. <laughs> I guess I took care of that. <laughs> all, all, no, no, all, all of the above and more. The re website is just established and we'll be building it out as time goes on to determine what the, what the needs are. But, but certainly, you'll be able to even buy tickets to the 60th anniversary. You'll, you'll be notified of, of current events that are happening at the NAACP. Uh, you'll be uh, uh, advised uh, as, as to issues that are relevant to uh, the national, uh, national advocacies and local advocacies as, as they are uh, developed. 
and uh, we, uh, co we coordinate and cooperate with other organizations and we'll be listing uh, events of theirs that are uh, in concert with our beliefs. Okay, did you have something to say? Oh, what's the time? Jace wants to know what time it is so he can come in gracefully late. The, what is <laughs> the time, of the, time of the meetings? Or, or the, no, the event. The event Six. starts at 7, 7 o'clock on November 8th uh, at uh, Lombardo's. Okay, well, thank you. Council Barnes, I think, might have had something. Anyone else? I know, I'm all set, thank you. Okay. I'm all set. Well, um, motion for favor recommendation. Second. Motion made properly. On the, on the second. motion. On the motion. I'd just like to mention when he was mentioning Lucia, Lucia Shannon and all the people that have done so much for uh, leadership on racial equality in the city, he left one person out. That's Steve Bernard. He's done so much work it's, in this city. It's, May I, may I take a moment to thank the, the NAACP members and supporters that have come with me to uh, have my back this evening. They're members of, uh, of our 60th anniversary uh, committee and some of my officers. If they would stand to be recognized. <clears throat> Motion made properly, second a favorable recommendation. Back to the full city council. All in favor, raise your hands, please. All opposed, motion carries. Council Stewart. Mr. Chair, I'd like the motion to have item number nine moved out of order, please. Motion. Contain a second? Second. Motion made properly, second to take agenda item number nine out of order. All in favor, raise your hands, please. Okay. Raise your hands, please. Opposed, motion carries. Number nine, Madam Clerk. Order that the City of Brockton Government Study Committee is hereby established to be comprised of seven citizens of the city, three of whom are to be appointed by the mayor and four of whom are to be appointed by the city council president. Each committee member shall be registered voter and to extent possible possess expertise or knowledge relevant to the work of such government study committee. The GSC is charged with exploring by whatever means it deems appropriate all aspects of local government, organization, and structure, the strengths and weaknesses in Brockton's current form of government in areas for improvement, alternative models of government, and recommend changes in such organization and structure, including, but not limited to, the terms of office, the method of selection of officials consistent with the needs of the city, and designed to achieve greater efficiency and effectiveness in the delivery of government services. Invited Honorable Mayor Bill Carpenter, Philip C. Nazarella, City Solicitor, Christopher Cooney, President and CEO of Chamber of Commerce, Thomas Minicello, Vice Chair, School Committee. Council Stewart. Mr. Chairperson, um, I filed this resolve and I will not have a lengthy opening, um, but, and I, the guest who I've invited here, I think can speak to the importance of this review committee. But as I stated earlier, um, you know, the last time the city reviewed our charter was over 50 years ago, and it's normal practice uh, in many communities to review how the city operates on a more regular basis every five years or 10 years or so to make certain that uh, how the city is structured is best serving uh, the needs in this century. Um, so certainly if we are a city that's interested in being as competitive as possible and as efficient as possible, uh, we don't want to have a city operating on a system that was created or revised in 1958. Um, this is a, a committee that will serve to provide recommendations on how the city is structured. Uh, as most people know, uh, a city's charter is really how the city operates. It's uh, the terms of the, of the offices, um, the offices that exist themselves, um, the roles and responsibilities of the various boards. Um, the city side as well as the school side. And so I think this review of how Brockton is structured is important, it's relevant, uh, and it's important if we want to remain competitive. So I, I've asked um, Chris Cooney, who's president of the chamber, to come and sort of to talk a bit about the importance of this kind of review and, uh, and, and whatever recommendations come from this review, um, how it can place our uh, business community uh, and how the government supports the business community um, in a better place. I've also asked the, the vice chair of the school committee to, to come in and um, share his, his thoughts on the importance of this uh, review committee. And of course, uh, the mayor who uh, is uh, our lead elected official here in the city uh, would love to get his, his take on the importance of this committee. Uh, I'll, I'll close by saying that this is not a formal board or committee uh, that needs necessarily uh, approval by the presenting the committee members to the city council for approval. Um, but this committee, I'm optimistic, will have a very talented, committed residents of the city representing a broad range of 
of experiences uh, who can bring their best <coughs> intellect and, and interest to the work. So, Mr. Cooney, I don't know if you want to come and, and speak briefly, and then um, our vice chair of the school committee. Sure. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Jace. Uh, the chamber is fully supportive of this. I'm not sure I could say it any better than the counselor <coughs> in terms of uh, some of the reasons you'd want to uh, at least gather some information. In terms of the chamber's perspective, as you probably know, uh, we have been expending some funds on uh, research uh, around things like this. Uh, the uh, CSX property in downtown Brockton, 33 acres, we recently uh, concluded a study of that just to kind of look at and draw some attention and put some light on uh, that uh, particular parcel of land right in downtown Brockton. We also uh, headed up the uh, branding of Brockton in the region, uh, again through another entity, state, um, the state agency, Conley Partners, who does the marketing for the state. and. Um, Thirdly, we just uh, are in the midst of a study of regional water uh, and sewer authorities. Again, these are studies uh, conducted by outside uh, entities, mostly UMass, Donahue Institute, which is their economic, their uh, Donahue Institute is their economic division, uh, research division. And I, I bring that to light because this would fall under, under a similar uh, type of initiative and the chamber would hope to put some funds maybe towards this. Uh, in the form of a northeastern study, the Dukakis uh, uh, Center, uh, and or possibly Suffolk uh, or UMass, uh, one of those entities, to try to lend some support to this. We think it's important just for us to stay uh, as a community up on some of the things uh, and some of the variations uh, that, that may exist within government. And uh, so that's, that's really where we're coming from. We all may have opinions, but it would be better if they were reformed in some type of research uh, that we all could look at and say, yeah, let's try that. Thank you. Thank, Thank, you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Cooney. Uh, Mr. Minicello, if you wanted to share your thoughts on this topic. Good, good evening, everyone. Thank you for having us here today. Um, I think it's always a good idea to review the different forms and committees, uh, form of government and committees that we have. We're obviously progressing in a uh, direction where we want to advance the um, assets and resources we have in Brockton, and it's certainly a good idea to see what committees are meeting, what committees are effective, what new committees might be uh, advantageous for the city of Brockton. Um, we, um, you know, we have a lot of newcomers coming into the city. We're a city of immigrants. Uh, the only thing that's changed is where people are coming from and what, um, what their backgrounds are. And there might be, uh, there might be some sort of uh, idea or ideas from uh, some of our new residents that might be advantageous for us all to consider in terms of making the um, making the initiation into our city and and certainly our our way of life here in Brockton uh, a smoother transition. So so I don't know exactly where this is going to go, but I certainly don't believe that it hurts any of us to to look at our form of government to see um, again what committees are meeting, what committees aren't meeting. Um, what, sh what should be eliminated, what should be added. I mean, um, it's really a, a good opportunity to, to, to review what we have, what's effective, and um, see where we can make recommendations for everyone here to, to chime in and, and see if uh, there's some new ways or innovative ways to move us in a direction that uh, the city wants to go into, especially with you know, becoming uh, an economic, uh, foe to be reckoned with here on the South Shore because of our, you know, certain proximities to, to Boston, the Cape, uh, to 495 to 95. Um, you know, our city's changing. Um, you know, Mr. Sullivan, you mentioned about getting ideas out of, uh, you know, New York City with respect to their traffic ideas. Well, we'll take a look at different governments and how they work in different communities and put in place what's right for Brockton. You know, we don't know exactly what just yet, but um, I think it's good to get people together to discuss, you know, the good things in places over here, the good things in places over here, the things that don't work for them, the things that might work for us. So um, it's, it, it's, it's a way to take inventory of where we're at and where we want to go. Thank you. Thank you, Attorney Minicello. Uh, and I, if the mayor wanted to, to comment on it at all, and I know the city solicitor had some, some thoughts as well. Well, I, th I think a lot's already been said, but... Uh, uh, Council, I, I certainly uh, share with you the idea that uh, the, the intent of the committee in terms of uh, taking an arm's length view at uh, our current city government 
and how it operates. I think it's a healthy, it's something we should be doing periodically uh, that hasn't been done for a while. Um, I think the extent to my involvement might be uh, when I propose a 10-year term for mayor, it may seem a little <laughs> self-serving. Um, so perhaps uh, a couple of former mayors and a couple of former city councilors would, would be appropriate for some, for some input. But uh, certainly if, if the council adopts this, I will do my best to find three highly qualified people to serve. Thank you. And Mr. City Solicitor? Uh, thank you, Councilor. Uh, on behalf of the law department, sometimes the law is divided between classifying what the spirit and intent of the law is and also what the black letter law reads. And I feel as solicitor I'm compelled to define in this instance what's black letter law. When we are talking about the existing charter, it is clear under the plan B form of government that all department heads in municipal boards are to be chosen by the mayor. And I only point this out so that the council is aware that a board is a board is a board, whether it's two members or six, formal or informal, it's a board. And the uh, choice of who serves on that board is within the discretion and appointment of mayoral authority. That being said, I know the administration looks at this undertaking as a very positive move, uh, is very anxious to work in conjunction with the city council, and I, I think Councillor Stewart, you're absolutely correct. The time has come in Brockton to take a comprehensive review of many of these uh, areas, laws, ordinances, and structure. Uh, so I, however, would be remiss if I did not make the comments I did so that years down the road, one would not look back to what Solicitor Nasrullah uh, deemed to be past practice or set some precedent. That is not the intent, and that's the reason why I make the comments I do, only so they are as a footnote within what's going forward and not uh, to create any bump in the road. I appreciate that, and you and I had a conversation about your concerns, and uh, I certainly agree that we want to have that noted uh, for future reference, and I appreciate the administration's support on this. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Mr. City Solicitor. So I'll open, it, open up uh, the floor for questions from our colleagues if there are any. Scott Thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and um, I thank Councillor Stewart for bringing this uh, before us this evening. Um, whether I agree wholeheartedly with it or not, I, I, don't, I don't know as of yet. Um, I don't have a problem with any such committee coming together to sit and study the form of government that we have here in the city and, and how we operate today. I just want to have an understanding in my head that you know if this order is adopted, um, by this council, then that means that the mayor and the city council president of the appointing authorities of this said committee. Am I correct? Is correct. That the way, that's the way I'm reading it. Okay. And I, I would, again, don't have a problem with somebody sitting down at you know, a big dining room table and having cups of coffee and discussing what we are doing right from wrong, and that's okay. And, and to be able to bring back some type of report to whether it be the city council to whomever, that's all right as well. But just keep in mind that no matter what has to be done, you now have to even, if I'm not mistaken, you've got to form even a charter commission would have to be voted in and you would have to have a charter change. It's all charter change. Government wasn't written overnight, not that I know of. I know people like to come in and change government overnight, but it, it just doesn't happen. Um, but again, I'll, I'll accept, you know, the fact that, you know, this committee is going to sit down and and, and decide whether or not you know city council should be uh, three years, uh, uh, you know three year terms or staggered terms. A school committee should not be, or maybe that should be appointed, or, or however that works. And, and, and go through what we what we we've been doing over the last several years. And some boards that may not have been meeting shouldn't be you know in in uh, in place any longer. That's okay as well. But just keep in mind it's all charter change. That doesn't happen overnight. And that's my greatest concern that I have. Um, you know, with this, but um, I'll accept, uh, you know, seeing some type of a study and, and take it from that point. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Council, point of information, you are correct on a home rule petition relative to a charter change. It would have to be vetted out at the House Council, Senate Council, and also a legal council for the governor. Then it would have to come back before the voters here in the city of Brockton for any change. That's this is just a mere informal study committee. Yeah, that's you right. are 100% on point. Thank, Thank you, Council. Council Bonds. Actually, that was my question. Thank you. 
Councillor Rodriguez. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I want to basically tag, tag along with something that um, Chris Cooney actually brought up in terms of um, you know, approaching some colleges or universities to do the, uh, the study. And I do see, um, I do see what Councillor uh, Stewart is trying to do in terms of looking at the, uh, the overall city um, uh, structure in the sense. But I do have to look at it and I have to approach it cautiously because every single study that exists can be skewed to work one way or the other depending on who's pushing the study. And I'm going to give you the, uh, the reason why I brought that up, I'm going to give you an example as to uh, what happened several years ago. We had um, acquired some funding from the Weed and Seed program to, uh, to conduct some sort of a study to see what we can implement uh, in the middle of the city in the sense. So a group from um, a specific college here in the area went out and did the study in the area and came up and reported to the group that in their study, uh, one of the key uh, components that they found uh, as far as what the citizens needed in that area was the ability uh, for them to contact the police officers who were doing the, um, the community policing in the area at the time. Now, mind you, that the area of study in question is the area south of uh, the Council on Aging, going south uh, between Maine and, Mon and uh, Warren Ave, an area that is heavily non-English speaking. Now this group used English speaking only folks to do the study. And they knocked on doors of folks that they could speak with. But we were ready to go ahead and purchase these phones to, so that these citizens that were, in, that were questioned or studied could actually communicate with the police, but yet at the same time, none of those, not, a, not a single one of those police officers in that area actually spoke a, uh, uh, a language other than English. But yet at the same time, that study told us that that's what those folks needed in that area. And the reason why I'm bringing this up is because when we open up to studies in the city, it's documented, it's happened over and over and over and over again in this city that those folks mostly affected by those studies are often not consulted or not studied, to be honest with you. So that being said, um, I, I actually have to pose a question because I've got the same concerns that uh, Councilor Aniri has in terms of, I see this basically biting too much at the same time. I think. Uh, if we want to study certain things within the, the city government that's not functioning properly, I don't think we should put it all in one big basket and study it all at once. I think we need to look at it, you know, step by step and take it one issue at a time. Because I frankly cannot be assured that every single person that, or at least the vast majority of the uh, folks that will be affected by these studies are going to be represented on those studies. And that's the fear in, the, in what bothers me about this whole process. And to be honest with you, I don't see uh, myself kind of supporting this as it presently stands. If it gets retweaked, uh, refined a little bit, where it's not, I mean, it seems like we're studying the entire Constitution of the United States here all at once. You know, it, it, to me, I think it needs to be redefined and taken, you know, step by step to basically look at something specifically that we want to change instead of putting it all in one big basket because I can, I can just see it now, you know, a, month, uh, a year from now or whatever, how long it takes to get this stuff done, it, this thing is going to be as thick as a Bible basically that we're going to be looking at, you know, in the overall changes in the city. So I think we need to look at it, you know, specifically and take it one step at a time. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councillor. Thank you. Point of information? Councillor. I, I agree with my colleague um, on, on two very important points. One is that we certainly want to make certain that all voices uh, are represented on the committee, and that's something that I'm certain both the President of the Council and the Mayor are committed to, and I, I certainly am. Uh, then secondly, uh, in terms of the scope of work of the committee, we've, in my early um, research, looked at uh, the work of um, other communities and uh, they've done it ver in, di in different ways. In some cases, it's a small town and they've taken on the entire structure of that community. In other cases, the municipality was a bit larger and they've decided as a committee to approach uh, it in a more you know, segmented kind of way. I do envision that once this committee is formed, that committee will 
have that discussion. What's the best way moving forward? Uh, and I, I think a, a very reasonable next step is for that community to report back to the city council how it plans to move forward, uh, what issues it plans to take on. Um, um, but I do, from my research, appreciate the fact that government is interconnected. Uh, and so it, it's a challenge to look at one particular piece and make recommendations about at least having some sense of how the whole works. And so I am optimistic that the committee will look at that entire picture um, at first and then decide that perhaps it is uh, more prudent to focus on one particular area. Uh, and also from my research, this process uh, typically is about 12 months or a little bit longer. Um, and so I think it will be thorough. It'll be lots of time for us to go in and refine uh, the work of this committee, um, but I wouldn't, uh, you know, the whole expression of uh, perfection being uh, the enemy of progress, whatever it happens to be, I do think we want to be careful um, not to uh, expect perfection as we put this together, but um, that we want to move on something that hasn't happened in over 50 years and it's needed and be very careful about who's participating and, and what the scope of work is. Thank you, Mr. Shepherd. Thank you, Councilor. Any other questions? Council, uh, if, if I might, just if I might, uh, Mr. Mr. Chairman, just, uh, uh, just a point of information uh, as we were talking about, um, you know, terms of office and just so people do recall, I think it was back in the mid 80s when uh, the voters had uh, the choice of making um, the decision of changing the, the mayor's office from two years to a four year um, office, um, and, and that only lasted for a short time, and it was then former Mayor Pataro who had one four-year term and then did not seek re-election in 1991, and then when, when Mayor uh, Fowell ran in 1991, the voters again had a choice to turn that back because the people of the city of Brockton were unhappy to the fact that there was a, a mayor serving for um, a term of you know, uh, four years and, and not in a two-year term. And then in 1991, we, uh, the voters had that choice to turn that back and Mayor Farrell uh, received the last of that um, four-year four -year term. It was his only term, a uh, matter of fact, as well. So, um, you know, th those concerns still will raise issue no matter what, you know, how the voters feel about that. And it seems always that the voters of, uh, um, and I'm not trying to pinpoint this, you know, because the mayor's here or whatever, it has nothing to do with that, but it seems like any, any time when you talked about a longer term uh, for a mayor to sit in the corner office, it, it, was, never, it was never a positive one. They let, they let it happen, but let's take it away because they just like the offices turning over every, every two years. So, I mean, again, that's something I'd, I'd, I'd just like to hear what that committee would have to say about that structure and, and, and the structure about the other um, elected positions as well. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Councilor. Anything else, Council? Motion made properly seconded, correct or no? Was uh, it seconded? I don't think it was made. Second. It wasn't made yet. It was made. It was. Okay, second. <laughs> Motion made properly seconded. Favorable recommendation back to the full city council. All in favor, raise your hand, please. All opposed, that motion carries. Thank you. Madam Clerk, we're going to go back to the front of the agenda now. Number four, please. Mr. Chairman. Yes, Council. I'm going to make a motion at this time to move a number eight out of order. Second. Motion made properly second to take agenda item number eight out of order. All in favor, raise your hands. All opposed, that motion carries. Madam Clerk, number eight, please. Order that the City Council authorizes the Mayor to enter into the intermunicipal agreement between the Town of Abington and the City of Brockton for transport and treatment of wastewater from Abington and transmission. This agreement is intended to supersede and replace the current agreement between the parties. I invited Honorable Mayor Bill Carpenter, John A. Conn, Chief Financial Officer, Larry Rowley, Acting Commissioner of DPW, David Norton, Contract Administrator, Philip C. Nazarella, City Solicitor, Christopher J. Petrini, Esquire Petrini & Associates, PC, John F. Stone, Abington, Superintendent of Utilities. Good evening, gentlemen. Attorney, please come forward. Thank you. Thank you. Council members, thank you. Uh, this matter has been before Council before, and it involves a comprehensive contract agreement between the city of Brockton and the town of Abington, uh, an intermunicipal agreement to service their wastewater. Uh, when we had discussed it over the past several months, uh, and this again was a contract that was put together over a couple of years, Councilor Dubois had brought up a couple of points and was concerned about an area of Brockton traffic and development. Uh, are those 
points she raised were well taken. We went back to the drawing board, worked on the agreement, revised the language, and I believe uh, to the satisfaction of Councillor Dubois, who had uh, texted me a message concerning the language. The language as revised uh, gives further uh, strength, monitoring, and maintenance power for the city of Brockton over the town of Abington's development of that area, which should diminish, if not evaporate, any concerns that would exist in and around that area. Uh, that being said, uh, I had sent hard mail copies to each and every council member with that revised language you should have it in front of you. And um, in fact, within the language, which extended the period of time Brockton has to make a determination, review the proposals of Abington, and vote approval for Abington's development, I refer in a couple of uh, portions within that paragraph Brockton shall have this or that right, <clears throat> Brockton meaning the city council. So that power and privilege is reserved for the city council over what Abington proposes in a certain area uh, appended to your and attached to your hard copy was a map showing a, uh, a circumference area that would take into place. So with that being said, if there are any questions, uh, I feel the time is now ripe for a uh, positive vote towards this contract. Thank you, Attorney. Thank you. I want to thank you and Attorney Petrini for all your efforts. I want to thank our neighbors in Abington for joining us again. I know it's been a long out process. Thank you for being here. Just for clarification, so it would be Brockton and Calmer by and through its city council, Calmer. That's correct. Thank you. Any questions? Mr. Chairman. Councilor Stadensky, followed by Ian Ari. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Zarrell, I want to thank you. As you know, I represent the ward that the major flow of every flush <laughs> happens in Brockton and elsewhere goes through my ward. And I much appreciate all the hard work by you, your team, the mayor, and the Abington team. And Thank with you. that, uh, I know Councilor Anary has uh, some questions, but I will make a motion shortly on a favorable. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. And, and not so much uh, a question as, as a comment as well. Uh, I know at the last time when we uh, voted on this particular issue, I was not in favor for some of the same issues that Council Dubois had risen at the, at the same time. But in, in seeing that and in knowing that you went back to the uh, uh, table to draw up the um, agreement in such a different form that shows brought in a little bit more strength, I think that was the most one thing that was important to me. So. What I see here this evening, I'm very pleased with, and I have, and I have all intentions of uh, supporting what you've done, and I appreciate all the hard work that has gone into it previous and even to what you did to, even to, to meet this agreement. So that's what's important to me, and, and I don't want to anyway do anything to detriment, you know, the city of Brockton in any such way in holding so, something up. So, I mean, I'm in favor of what's before me this evening. Thank, thank, you, thank you, Councilor. Thank you, Councilor. Thank you. Councilor Cruz. Uh, I hereby uh, move to recommend favorably to the full city council conditioned upon including in the intermunicipal agreement for transport of wastewater services the addendum attached here too, which we just spoke. Second. 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 With the clarification that the with Brock the clarification the city that, that that line of, with the buy-in through the city council is included. Motion made properly second for a favorable recommendation of this uh, agreement between the town of Abington and the city of Brockton. Back to the full city council. All in favor, please raise your hand. All opposed, that motion carries with the addendum attached there too. Thank you very thank much. Thank you, thank you, Mr. President. Thank you again, folks from Abington, thank you. Sure Madam Clerk, we're going to go back to agenda item number four, please. Order appropriation $5,187.72 from the Massachusetts Association of Health Boards, Plymouth County Region 5 Emergency Coalition Grant Fund to the City of Brockton Board of Health Massachusetts Medical Reserve Corp Grant Fund for the purpose of building the level of volunteers for the Area Medical Reserve Corp. Invited Honorable Mayor Bill Carpenter, Johnny Conn, Chief Financial Officer, Louis Tataglia, Executive Director of Board of Health. Again, Councilors, Mr. Tataglia unfortunately couldn't join us today and he gave me notice on that. Mr. Conning, good evening. Good evening, Councilors. Uh, this is an annual grant. Uh, there's no match from the city. <clears throat> and the intent of the grant is to provide funding for uh, Lou Tataglia to be able to recruit this uh, Medical Reserve Corps, provide uh, information to them to bring them onto the uh, Oops, Reserve Corps team. Second. Second. Okay. Motion made properly. Second. Favorable recommendation back to the Council. All in favor, raise your hands. All opposed. That motion carries. Thank, Thank you, Councilors. Item number five, please. 
Order appropriation $44,435 from the Massachusetts Emergency Management Agency Performance Grant Program, the Brockton Emergency Management Agency. Beamer intends to use these grant funds to purchase operational equipment for Beamer as well as the Emergency Operations Center. Invited Honorable Mayor Bill Carpenter, John A. Conant, Chief Financial Officer, and Stephen Hook, Beamer Director. Mr. Director, good evening. Good evening, Councilors. Uh, this grant is going to be used to uh, fund the emergency um, management operational equipment, uh, communications equipment, shelter equipment, uh, portable generators, and uh, emergency go kits, we call them, which are um, kits we can hand out to a resident and, and uh, business owners if they have a, um, a disaster. Motion recommend favorably. On the motion. Second. Very good. Motion counts to Stewart. Mr. Person. Mr. Uh, Mr. Hook, I, I believe this is your second time before us with uh, monies that you've been able to generate for BEMO. Is that correct? Correct. Um, and so thank you and congratulations. And, thank you. Uh, and I don't think I remember um, BEMO coming before uh, this frequently in, 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 this, in this kind of time frame in terms of grants that, you, that the organization has um, been awarded. Um, so I wanted to thank you for that, and, uh, and this is a significant amount of money, and I think it's uh, very much needed, because I've done uh, two tours of, of BEMA over the, uh, since being on the City Council, and it always felt it was uh, an under-resourced uh, operation, so thank you. Thank you, Council. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chairperson. Motion made properly, second to favor. Oh, on, on the motion, motion Mr. Council Rodriguez. Thank you, sir. Um, Mr. Hook, uh, are there any plans to um, to move uh, Bema from its present location to an area that's probably a little more uh, accessible to the entire city. You mean the office itself? The office, yeah. the operations. Yes, um, through the mayor's office, the mayor has got us a office at the Moore Memorial, and uh, the, the building department is now um, installing some phone networking cables there, and we'll be moving in probably by mid-November. And why, why the move? Uh, a couple of reasons. Um, <clears throat> like you said, accessibility. Uh, being at the VA is not, um, we've had some security issues. We've had some issues with people uh, with, with access. We came into the office one day and we had found that somebody had gone through some <coughs> files. So we feel that, I feel that a uh, city-owned building is more secure, obviously, and a, probably a place we should be. We're not going to abandon the VA. We'll use it as a backup office, but we, we should be in a city-owned building, in my opinion. Uh, thank you, Mr. Hook. I, I too, want to echo the, uh, the words from uh, Councilor Stewart in terms of uh, congratulating you on, uh, on going after some funding to make sure that our you know, emergency response is actually at a level that it should be for a city of our size. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Councilor Cruz. Thank you. I just want to point out, I do want to thank Mr. Hook, but I do want to point out that Mr. Schleffer was in front of us quite often with grant monies okay. that he had uh, obtained, uh, and I just I remember wanted that, that to go on the record. Uh, Mr. Schleffer did a great job and was here. You're doing a great job too, Mr. Hook, but I didn't want to let that go. That's so. an accurate statement. Thank, thank you, you. Councilor. Anything else on the motion? Motion made properly, second to favor, recommendation back to the Council. All in favor, raise your hands, please. All opposed, motion carries. Thank you. Mr. Hook. Madam Clerk, number six, please. Order. Mass General Law Chapter 258, Section 13 provides for, by local acceptance, indemnification of municipal officers elected or appointed from personal financial loss and expense, including reasonable legal fees and costs, if any, in an amount not to exceed $1 million. Invited Philip C. Nazarella, City Solicitor. That's Cruz. Mr. Chairman, uh, there's a few questions on this. I'd like to make a motion to table. Second. Motion made properly, second to table. All in favor of tabling, please raise your hand. Motion, all opposed, motion carries. The matter is tabled, number six is tabled. Number seven, please. Order, the City Council of the City of Brockton petitions the Great and General Court under the provisions of Section 8 of Article 89 of the Amendment to the Constitution of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts for an act as follows, an act providing for rent regulations and the control of evictions in manufactured housing and mobile home communities in the City of Brockton. Invited Philip C. Nazarella, City, city a Solicitor. Right, Nazarella. Good evening. Good evening. I don't know if there's a particular question. Uh, I had reviewed this uh, as to what the intent is. Uh, my understanding is this would be an act of the legislature. Uh, the only question I had, uh, and I am unaware of the answer, uh, and 
I believe I'm familiar with the particular location of the properties in question. My understanding was that those properties, uh, those mobile homes and manufactured homes were owned by the occupants, which would eliminate that from rent control. There is no rent control on the homes that are owned by the people. If the, the whole uh, fee is owned by the individual. If I might. Councilor Stadetsky. Councilor, I realize they own the homes, but they rent the property the homes sit on. That's what we're looking to control. And they're looking for, they, they feel they've been gouged. And they're looking for not, no increase. They're looking for something that the homeowner in the city of Brockton goes with, which is 2.5%. All right. Well, I, th I think it'll be a, uh, an interesting analysis then, because if we're talking about the increase in the, the underlying turf, which the home lies on, and it's related to uh, the, the tax, the municipal tax, uh, I don't know what flexibility or control lies therein, but again, it goes to the state legislature. Thank you. Point of information, Point Councilors, uh, in the town of Easton, our neighboring community across uh, on 138 across from the old Diplomat restaurant, there is a mobile home park. They do have rent control there, but Attorney Nezarel is 100% accurate. This would be an act of the legislature. Detain a motion on this. Well, Point of information. So, yeah, and I believe we are aware that this would be a home rule petition um, and that this legislation was modeled off of what was done in Easton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Council. Motion to move favorably to the full city council. Second. Second. Motion made properly seconded. A favorable recommendation back to the full city council. All in favor, please raise your hands. All opposed, that motion carries. Favorable recommendation back to the council. Thank you, attorney. Madam Clerk, we are going to. <laughs> 13. 13. Number 13, please. Council Neary, please take my. Uh, 13, please. Madam Resolve Clerk. that the city's mayor, veterans services director, solicitor, building superintendent, and Dr. Robert Hagland, co-chair of the restoration project, come before the finance committee to discuss the previous War Memorial building restoration efforts. Invited Honorable Mayor Bill Carpenter, Philip C. Nazarella, city solicitor, James Cassieri, superintendent of building, David A. Farrell, veterans director, Dr. Robert Hagland, co-chairman of the restoration project. Councilor Sullivan. Mr. Chairman, thank you, Councilor. It's just, uh, just to kind of Go back to the uh, month of June during the budget hearings. As you may recall, I stepped down and I asked this question uh, to the mayor and to Mr. Kassiri and I think to Mr. Conn, and, and uh, nobody, including the city council, had any idea on uh, what, what there was in terms of a balance, uh, how much was generated. As you remember, uh, Council Denapoli, uh, myself, I'm sure some of the others purchased the bricks. Uh, they went for $150 up to $350. Uh, there was a black tie gallery, as you would call. Ted Kennedy was there. Mr. F Attorney Feinberg was there at the Shaw Center. This was under the Harrington administration. Uh, Dr. Hagelin, just for point of information, has retired his practice, uh, dentist practice. He's moving down. He has moved down to uh, the state of Florida. Uh, but it is my understanding that um, some money uh, has been uh, uh, designated as such, I think $20,000. I know the Brockton Enterprise, through their reporter, Joe Markman, has done some due diligence. I know the mayor had a, had a, a meeting at the War Memorial with the trustees as well. Um, some people had asked me, you know, why, why I brought this up. I think it was extremely important. People donated money, and it was for a good cause. There was two foundations involved. There was the Feinberg Foundation, the War Memorial Foundation, both, uh, to my understanding, 501c3s. So I think this is a collaborative approach with the mayor, uh, with anybody on the, uh, on the War Memorial uh, Board and the city council, because we needed to find out if there was money. And uh, with that being said, um, I believe that there is some money, and I'd like to know where it is and what it's, the debt balance is and how much is being held and, and stuff like that. So maybe, Mr. Mayor, if you have any update for us, that'd be great. Sure, Councilor. And, and as we discussed in June, I think we, we shared those questions. Uh, as, the councilor, uh, as the council president uh, outlined, the uh, War Memorial Board of Trustees in a meeting last week uh, had a couple representatives of the uh, the Feinberg Charitable Fund and the War Memorial Charitable Fund uh, appear in front of it. Uh, accountant Terry Creeden, who's handling the funds nowadays, uh, and also um, Carl Landerholm, who I guess sits on the board of the War Memorial Trust. Um, Mrs. Creeden uh, indicated that there was a, she was first very, very clear to indicate to us that uh, these were private charities and she would disclose information to the extent that she 
wanted to disclose and felt that uh, a lot of it was privileged and we didn't necessarily have a right to. But having said that, she did provide us with some information uh, regarding the bricks. Uh, she said that it was 52 or 53,000, $52,000 $52, was the total raised from the sale of bricks. Uh, Mr. Landaholm said he had checked the bricks and that all bricks that were that money was accepted for have been placed. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, Mr. President, uh, uh, Dr. Haglin was kind of the primary person uh, over the years and, and understanding that myself and all of the members of the Woman Real Board of Trustees, these questions about a, t a t period of time before any of us were involved. So uh, I think it was more of a trying to gather some information to understand exactly where we're at. So uh, Accountant Creedon informed us that uh, there was a balance of about $10,000 in the Feinberg Charitable Trust, but that trust is being uh, closed out. And uh, it's going to cease to exist essentially because Dr. Haglin now being retired uh, in Florida, a couple other folks that have been involved in the past aren't here anymore. So in essence, they're just closing that one out and that one won't exist anymore. They'll just they'll do with that money as they please. They're not obligated to necessarily give that money to the War Memorial. Uh, she said the source of that money was private donors, not the sale of the bricks. Um, she said that they had expended a number of years ago uh, over $100,000 uh, towards the War Memorial building, of which that contained the 52,000 for the, the sale of the bricks. Uh, so. The Feinberg charity is being closed out. The 20,000 uh, you referenced, Mr. President, she did also inform the board that they were going to leave the remaining $20,000 in the War Memorial Charitable Fund, and that was for the purpose of the perpetual care of the brick walkway. So that would cover the city's expenses for maintenance and upkeep of the brick walkway over the years that they had accepted the donations for. Uh, she did indicate there might be a scenario where if they got some new people on the board of the War Memorial Trust that they may be, it's a possibility that they might be willing to work with the War Memorial Board of Trustees in terms of being a conduit for some private fundraising or, or applying for grants similar to the model that we have with the library where we have a library board of trustees that oversees the operation of the library there's also a library foundation that's kind of a private fundraising arm. But the answer to your question, it would appear one, one fund is being closed out. The other one will have about $20,000 uh, left behind in it for the purpose of uh, future care of the brick walkway. And uh, in terms of the specifics of what was exactly paid for by the charitable funds previously a number of years ago, uh, that was a little vague. There was a promise to send out to us some more detailed information. We have not received that yet at this time. Uh, however, I'll, the vast majority of the money that has gone into the building has been government money, mm -hmm. um, CDBG funds over the course of several years. So um, did you already give out those numbers? Or? So Mr. Kasseri has the information for you on the remainder of the money outside of the, the Feinberg and War Memorial Trust, uh, the, the funds that have been expended on the building previously, and, and uh, the source of all of these funds, roughly $2.7 million, was CDBG funds that flowed through the city. I'll turn it over to Mr. Kassiri. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Mayor. <clears throat> Mr. Kassiri, Commissioner. Thank you. Any, How are you? Councilor yeah. Sullivan, uh, you, any questions for the commissioner? Or? I'm just looking at this right now, Chair. I mean, I think, I think at the end of the day, um, thank well, you, first of all, thank you for this, yeah, and thank you for the update, Mr. Mayor. Um, and and I'm, I am a little troubled that um, 
the, uh, the accountant, although I applaud her for giving us some of the information, but um, to kind of hide behind the cloak of nonprofit is a little uh, suspect in my humble opinion. Uh, the fact that citizens in the Brockton, we paid a lot of money, we donated a lot of money. I mean, a lot of us that are on the council now uh, went to that event that night and it was a great night. It was really, really great. It raised a ton of money. So, um, you know, it's, it's great that there's a 10 grand balance somewhere and a 20 grand balance, but my question would be how much was originally uh, rendered, right? How much did they make that night, number one? Where was it held? Where's this 30 grand being held? You have to do a final with the Secretary of State every single year when you're a nonprofit, a 501C, and the, and the IRS. Um, and again, um, someone had said to me the other day, why would you stir the pot now and finger point? I'm not finger pointing. I think all of us that day, uh, the mayor, Mr. Kassiri, Mr. Condon, solicitor, everybody here, we we're on the same page, right? We want to just get to the bottom of it. So the fact that the CPA has not gotten back to us yet, gotten back to the CEO of the city of Brockton, the mayor is troubling. And, uh, you know, I, it, again, I'm only one of 11, but if we need to do an independent audit, I want to do it because we owe that to the people that donated the money. That's what it comes down to. This is great, Mr. Kassiri. I, 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 I truly appreciate your time on this because I know it's not, not easy to come up with this. Um, so in terms of the, the 52 grand that they said was for the sale of the bricks, um, the 100,000 and the 52 was included in that. Is that's designated, is that, is that a, uh, agenda item, I mean, number one on the, on the docket here? No, that's all money spent, CDBG money. It's all CDBG. I can't account for any of their money because I don't know. I mean, she, uh, the, Mrs. Creedon wasn't totally forthcoming in my opinion, but she, we have as, exactly what the mayor told you is exactly what transpired at that meeting. Uh, Council Monahan also attended the meeting and um, what she told us is what she told us. We don't have an exact accounting of the exact amount of money that was raised and exactly how it was expended and what it was spent on. We don't have that. Point of information. Councilor Moynihan. And I, I, just, I thought she said that they had put, was it 158 or 185,000 into the War Memorial? Is that what they actually I spent? remember a, a figure of $180,000 total. And I, I believe she said that she thought that they had spent maybe a hundred or eighty thousand dollars on design of the addition that includes the elevator. The elevator, right? And fifty-two thousand on the bricks, bricks, which would come to one hundred and thirty-two, which would leave whatever. I mean, we don't have any. There was no paperwork handed to us at all. She held the paperwork, and basically, she said she would give that information to the trustees. She didn't give it that night though. And th the donors will not be on that, which we really don't need to know who the donors are, but just where the money is, how much money was raised, where it went, mm -hmm. and that's about it. So I'm hoping at, after that meeting, I know it was kind of like uh, Jim said, it was sort of vague here and there, but uh, uh, I'm hoping that the board of trustees will get it, that information. Although they did give it to the enterprise, so I don't know what the difference is, but. <laughs> Correct. But anyway, thank you. Tell yeah, I mean, we're, to, we're, we're talking six to seven years ago that people made this money. And, and again, uh, and Mr. Farrell, I want to thank you for being here as well. Um, I, I, I thought it was um, appropriate to include you on this as well. But I, I, I think I'm going to have to, uh, I'm sure there's other questions, but I, I, I'm going to make a, a motion to continue this um, because I think we need to work collectively with the mayor. Um, I think we need to definitely deal with our um, legislative council, Mr. Gilday, but also our, our, good, our great city solicitor, Phil Nazarello, because we need to find out what the heck's going on. I mean, I'm kind of stupefied by it, to be honest with you. As a professional CPA, to not be forthcoming is a little troubling again. I agree, and, and many times throughout this big dig, as I used to call it, um, <laughs> it's come out beautiful. The building is really is beautiful, so. I Wait, can't maybe, maybe the figures are there, Jim. Maybe no one, I mean, maybe every penny donated was, was spent, but, but, but we just need to know that. Nobody was ever forthcoming, though. I mean, Doc Haglin was asked that by, by uh, the former mayor. I'm not sure if this mayor ever met with him or not. I don't, I don't think you ever did, no. And, and I was at meetings where he was pretty much the same way as this Mrs. Creedon was, where it's, uh, it's our money and we can decide where we're spending it and we're not telling. You know, maybe we could do a pull-through strategy with our great friend, uh, Mr. Feinberg. 
you know, he comes to Brock and he, he's good friends with the mayor as well. But I mean, it's his name. So maybe that's just something. But with that, unless any of my colleagues. Second, I second the investigation motion. Motion can, made can I second. say one more thing? Uh, oh, no. I have questions before yeah, we get to a motion. In second, but before and any continuance on, there are some other counselors who have some questions. I'll take your comment, Mr. I just didn't want anybody in TV land watching thinking that the city can't account for every single penny that was spent by the city and by the CDBG funds. This has nothing to do with transparency on the city's part. Mm -hmm. I just want to make sure that everyone watching understands. Yeah, and I don't think that, that that wasn't my intent at all. Oh, I know it wasn't. No, no, my I intent is, is the money that was donated. Nothing to do with federal money um, or state money. It's strictly private donors money yeah. where'd it go and and where, where's it sitting i mean if there's 30 grand is it sitting in harbor one is it sitting in credit credit where is it how much is it earning interest is it a, it might be in a 401k for all i know i don't know an ira so um <coughs> I'll, I'll, I'll yield to you mr chair thank you council Councilor cruz thank you um uh, i think maybe i want mr nizrello to get up because uh yes, please. and obviously mrs creedon's working for her whoever's paying her but these organizations when they register as a 5013C, they have to give a reason for their existence, correct? That's correct. And there was no question that these organizations raised money in the aspect of working, spending that money on the War Memorial Building. There's no question in my mind. I mean, that was, we all spent money at the time. Um, so th that, that 5013C has to be registered with the Secretary of State, correct? Yes. So we should be able to go in there and find out what the reasoning was for that? Well, it would be on the articles of organization what the, the reasons were. It may be for charitable purposes. I, I don't know if it specifically said War Memorial. I haven't seen it. But, but certainly it the, will be listed what their purpose is. Certainly the fundraising they did at the time was to repair and fix the War Memorial building. Correct. There's no question about that. Right. So if the money wasn't spent on the War Memorial or if they... Uh, in effect, it, uh, I get a little, uh, I'm unclear, I'm not an attorney, they're going to close down that, that one foundation. If there's money left over, it, if that's what the money was raised for, wouldn't a court say that's where the, where the money has to go? Correct. The next question, uh, next question. Can I res respond to that, Counselor? Yeah. I just want to share with you what her answer was when we kind of asked the same question, when the board asked the, the same question the other night. Uh, her position was that the Feinberg Charitable Trust was not obligated to put the money into the War Memorial Building, that uh, uh, she felt the extent of their obligation to put money into the War Memorial Building was the 52000 that was raised on the sale of the bricks, that additional funds that came into that charity from private donors, um, that there, were not, there was not a requirement that they did not have to spend that money on the War Memorial Building. She did say that they have been filing their returns every year, and that's public record. She said that those returns would show no activity at all the past couple of years. Um, so I think that the approximately 10,000 that's left in there, the impression that I got, and I don't want to speak for Mrs. Creed, and it's the first time I met her, um, the impression I got was they're going to disperse that 10,000 however they see fit, and shut that charity down. Um, dissolve it, I think, was the word that she used. Uh, and that the War Memorial Trust Fund has $20,000 in it that they intend to leave there for future care of the bricks. So, I mean, um, I'm just relaying as best I can from my memory what was said at the meeting the other night. Uh, as you said, Mr. President, the Enterprise was present for that meeting and did report on it, it was an open public meeting, uh, and there was a uh, commitment from her to send us some additional detail on funds that had been expended in the past, but as of, you know, the last time I checked my email this afternoon, I had not received anything as of this time. And those funds that have been expended in the past, you said that they intimated it was around $180,000? Yeah, that, that was a Any money spent on the War Memorial Building, correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. Nezrella, Attorney Nezrella, would have had to have been accepted by this city council, I believe. Wouldn't that be true? Anytime somebody tries to give the city money, we have to accept it. I'd prefer to look at the articles of organization to find out how that money is 
supposed to flow. So it may be distinguished from the normal way in which the city accepts money or is authorized to accept money. I, I, I would just pause to qualify that answer without, I haven't looked at any well, of the documents. Well, like when the Library Foundation wants to help us That's out, correct. they do a great job. They come here and we have to approve the acceptance of that money. Correct. And I, well, you'll have to get back to us on that, but I would imagine that we would have had to approve any money that came in to do work on that building. Yeah, I, ju I just don't want to make the assumption I prefer to look at it and give you a definitive answer. If you could on that, because I don't recall, I've been here almost 10 years now, and I don't recall that we ever accepted that money. And I apologize, I have money. not had privy to any of the documents, never had cause to examine them. Uh, I can do that and give you a more definitive response. If you could. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Council Barnes and Council Sullivan. Yes, uh, just actually a, a few questions. Uh, the brick campaign, when was that? Everybody says about six or seven years ago, was 2007. that? 2007. 2007? 2007, 2008. 2008, okay. You can actually, Council, the point of information, you can actually go online, Google it, and you'll find the actual sheet, the sign up sheet with the stipulations 150 for a small brick, 350 for a large brick. Okay, okay. I, I, I remember around the time, because I know my boss has a brick there, um, and they sent me over to make sure it was laid there. Um, and I guess, uh, Mr. Casseri, these this sheet that you gave, it, it chronicles you know, some of the bigger ticket items for some of the repairs and the upgrades and the restoration of the building. Were there any other repairs or um, rehab of that building that's not listed on here? Yeah, well, that's, this is many years right here, and through that time, we, we also maintained that building out of my budget. Well, well from, budget. let me just be more clear. So after 2008, so after the 2008 design of the electrical upgrade, Anything else that was done to the building, to your knowledge, that is not listed here, not done with CDBG funding? Yes, but with, with money I can account for in my budget, like the driveway, we did that. Okay. We've done landscaping projects, some fencing, some internal other things that we do. Okay. But I, if you're asking if I recall using any money from their funds, I don't. I never used any of them. Okay, so, so, so there wasn't like an awning or something that showed up on a Friday afternoon or something? No, but as what Councillor Cruz was alluding to, I suppose they could have gone out and bought things with their money and brought them to the building. Um, maybe they could have bought furniture there or some cabinets or something for the symphony, but we just had no accounting of, of that happening that was given to us. So we'd just be speculating at that. Okay, you actually brought something up that I didn't think about, the symphony. Um, did, uh, does anyone know if either of these charitable foundations have, have had or have a relationship with the symphony to be able to do that, maybe repairing any kind of um, uh, materials or things that they might need, instruments and things? Councilor, with, uh, with no specifics provided, there was an inference that uh, there had been monies donated to the symphony from that Feinberg Charitable Trust. Okay. It was alluded to, there was no specific number given, but uh, there was a comment made that would have indicated that they've probably made some disbursements to the symphony out of the, not out of the War Memorial Fund, but out of the Feinberg Fund. Okay, and that's the one that they said was totally private and don't ask? That was her position on both of the charitable funds that, uh, uh, that we really, her position was that we had no oversight of those accounts. They were private charities that uh, she was there because she had, you know, had been an, asked to appear and was providing the information she chose to provide. Um, uh, so, you know, as I say, most of us, came on board long before this stuff happened, so uh, I'm hoping some additional detail is sent to us, but in terms of the, the symphony question, uh, there was an inference that it, it seemed to me that she was saying that out of the Feinberg Fund, um, some monies had gone to the symphony, and she was also clear that the Feinberg Fund was not obligated to put that remaining 10000 in, that that money was from private donors that was not specifically earmarked for the War Memorial Building. It was private donations to the Feinberg Fund. Okay. Her, her explanation, not mine. Okay, and just to be very, very clear, the inference or, or, or the takeaway 
uh, from CPA Creedon was that the brick money that was collected, it was absorbed in other projects that were done at the War Memorial, correct? No, she, she indicated that, and I forget the exact number, the numbers changed unless they say there was no paper backup provided. She was referring to some of her notes uh, that you know, we've asked for you know, the information. She said she would send us a, a spreadsheet with, uh, that would indicate what the disbursements were. Um, whether that'll have any backup with it or not, I don't know. Um, but the, uh, her position was that uh, the 52,000 that was brought in from the bricks was all put into the building. And in addition to that, additional funds were put into the building that came from private donors to the Feinberg Fund. Okay. And so the remaining $20,000 or whatever that are, that's in the War, the War Memorial Charitable arm, um, and actually I think this, I think this was asked or, or something, it might have to go to the next time we meet about this, but who will be responsible for that money? Anybody on the trustees? And if so, are any of the trustee positions bonded positions? Well, again, her position is that we, they're a private charity, that we don't have any oversight over them. But um, I believe that she said that uh, she and Mr. Landerholm were the remaining trustees that are still local for the War Memorial Fund and that, uh, that they would look at, I believe she said they would look at putting, a, if we decided to keep the money in there, they would look at appointing a couple more trustees. What she stated was that the intent of leaving the 20,000 in that one account uh, would be to provide to the city future care, perpetual care for the brick walkway. So who's been taking care of the brick walkway now? The city, we've been paying for that? Yeah, we, we maintain the whole building, yeah. So from 2008 to now, none of the money in that, either one of those accounts has gone to that. You, you, know, you know, I think what we were all taken by, I, I can't speak for anyone else, I was taken by surprise. I thought when we had this meeting, she was gonna come in with what I just did, and mm -hmm. we were all gonna see what she spent, and everybody would have the answers, and we'd all be happy, and that didn't happen. And I can only speak for myself. I left that meeting shaking my head that mm -hmm. I thought what we were asking was very simple requests. Um, I was at the Feinberg thing uh, uh, event when Senator Kennedy spoke, and look good I, I in that was tux too, totally. Mr. You look good in your Didn't tux I? that Thank night, you. yeah. And I was totally under the same impression you were that all the money we were raising from the Feinberg Foundation was going to go into the War Memorial Building. And when we had the meeting last week, I was surprised that it wasn't a simple accounting given to us. That's mm -hmm. just my personal takeaway. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, Councillor. Councillor Sullivan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. If I could, um, Mr. Mayor, respectfully, uh, if, if we could, the City Council collectively could ask if you wouldn't mind sending her a letter from your office just to maybe f speed up her, uh, her action. Um, because uh, it's, again, I, I keep saying the word, but it's troubling, to say the least. With that, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, Councilors, I'm going to uh, make a motion to continue this until uh, we'll give her a little bit of time, um, not too long. The second FinCom and the month of November. Second. Motion's been made and second that we continue this item until the second FinCom in the month of November. All in favor? Opposed? Goes to that, uh, that, that particular Thank meeting. you, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. And item number 14, uh, as I indicated, counselors at the beginning of the meeting, uh, Aquaria had, had informed me as the president uh, that the gentleman, uh, Moses Parente, is out of the country. So I'd like to entertain a motion. If um, I'll make a motion that we postpone to the second meeting, in, uh, FinCon meeting in November. Second. second. Motion made properly second to continue this until the uh, second FinCon, not the first, the second FinCon, third Monday of the month in November. All in favor, please raise your hand. All opposed, motion carries. Before we conclude, counselors, just a reminder, um, uh, Superintendent Smith is, is having the school site visit this coming Saturday, which is October 25th, 8 a.m. to 12 p.m. noon. It starts 8 o'clock at Brockton High in the Auditorium Little Theater. There will be a, a continental breakfast. It's going to be a good day to go around and really get a, a feel of the schools. I know the mayor and the school committee as well, so I uh, hope to see everybody there. Anything else? Meeting is hereby adjourned. <laughs>